This week on Mississippi Insight, both House and Senate Republicans are working with Democrats to pass some form of Medicaid expansion. But what are the odds of final passage with the governor's debt set against it? And what risk might Mississippi face as lawmakers seek to cut into health coverage gaps? We'll hear from Magnolia Tribune's Russ Latino about his concerns, and we'll recap Governor Reeves' State of the State address and his plans for his final term. That's all ahead this Sunday on Mississippi Insight. I'm Byron Brown. Thanks for joining us for this March 3rd edition of Insight. There have been some big legislative developments since last week when we explored the prospects for Medicaid expansion in Mississippi. Senate negotiators are working ahead of a Tuesday deadline to push their version of a Medicaid expansion bill out of committee. This follows landmark passage of a House bill to expand Medicaid. That bill was principally authored by House Speaker Jason White himself in the face of intense opposition by his fellow Republican, Governor Tate Reeves. House Medicaid Chairwoman Missy McGee introduced the bill on the House floor on Wednesday. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, I bring before you House Bill 1725. Beyond the policy and politics of this issue, what we really have before us is a solution to a fundamental challenge, access to health care. It's a topic that should transcend politics and economics, for at its core, it is about the well-being and dignity of every Mississippian. Providing opportunities for health insurance is not just a matter of policy, it is a moral imperative and a reflection of our state, our, the values of our state. Unfortunately, we as lawmakers can often find ourselves being accustomed to some of the negative indicators regarding our state's quality of life. We hear them a lot, but what we have to remember is that these statistics aren't simply numbers on a page. They reflect the tough circumstances faced by actual people. They show the poor conditions experienced by many of our citizens. We need to feel these things. We need to feel the fact that Mississippians have the shortest life expectancy in the nation. We need to feel the fact that we have the highest rate of preventable deaths, meaning that more Mississippians die unnecessarily than anywhere else. And the reason these things often occur is poor access or no access to care. So many don't have a medical home where they can detect diseases like diabetes and hypertension early in order to prevent fatal complications. So many can't get proper screening for colon or breast cancer when these and other cancers can be diagnosed at a curable stage. We need to feel the weight of that. Furthermore, we need to own the fact that women that getting women access to primary care before they get pregnant allows them to be healthy when they do become pregnant. Because if we don't and a woman gets pregnant already having hypertension and diabetes and in many cases not knowing that she has it, this immediately puts her pregnancy at high risk, meaning that both the woman and the baby have a greater risk of death. This is why Mississippi also leads the nation in maternal mortality, infant mortality, and fetal mortality. Despite our best efforts, we need to understand Mississippi can still be a very dangerous place for an unborn child. Simply because women of childbearing age aren't getting the preventive care they need before they get pregnant. We need to feel that. For more than a decade, our state has said no to the provisions offered by the federal government to provide basic coverage to low-income working people of Mississippi. In fact, many of the leaders in our state, good, well-intentioned people, have refused to even allow a conversation to come forward in the form of a bill. Yet we have, we have yet to offer anything that can actually address the problem. No one has presented a better or more affordable way, and no is not a policy that has helped or will help low-income working Mississippians. Over the last 12 years, Mississippi has experienced the benefits of conservative leadership and seen the positive results that come from conservative policies. As I've traveled across the state visiting with business leaders, community officials, and ultimately voters, the most consistent message I hear is a demand to address the shortfalls in our healthcare accessibility and availability in Mississippi. I found the desire to keep Mississippians in the workforce and out of our emergency rooms 
transcends any political party and impacts all regions of our state. Our determination to improve access to health care is a vital piece of the economic puzzle as a healthy workforce supports a healthy economy. The House of Representatives approach called Healthy Mississippi Works will provide real affordable solutions for our state's hardworking, low income population. Healthy Mississippi Works, which passed off the floor today by a large vote margin, will cover the age group of 19 to 64, earning up to 138% of the federal poverty level and require employment for at least 20 hours a week in a position where health insurance is not provided or alternatively, the individual must be enrolled full-time in school or a workforce training program. The program will come at a minimal, call, minimal to no cost to the state with the federal government providing 90% of the funding and the remaining 10% will come from Mississippi's managed care organizations through a tax. We have also added a four-year repealer to this legislation, which essentially makes this a pilot program that will exist for four years at little or no cost to the state and will allow us to collect true statistics on Mississippians and compile information on these beneficiaries and allow the legislature to make informed decisions and changes if needed or ultimately end the program if it is truly found to be unsuccessful. Our desire is to get this right. Governor Reeves reacted quickly to the House effort. He wrote on social media, quote, the truth is this, Representative McGee's bill is straight Obamacare Medicaid expansion. Applies to as many as 300,000 able-bodied adults who could work but may choose not to, end quote. After the break, we'll talk with another critic of Medicaid expansion. Russ Latino offers his take when Mississippi Insight continues. As we continue to explore potential Medicaid expansion at the state capitol, it's important to realize that such a move could be very complicated and we won't be done without some level of risk, as our next guest has written. Russ Latino is the publisher of MagnoliaTribune.com. He joins us now by Zoom. Russ, welcome back to Mississippi Insight. Thanks. To, good to be back with you. Thank you. Well, you have voiced a lot of concern about expanding Medicaid in Mississippi. Talk about those for a moment. Yeah, I think there are some risks that are worth considering by lawmakers. I mean, anytime you're talking about a policy that costs billions of dollars, uh, that affects hundreds of thousands of people, an entire healthcare industry and an entire economy, uh, it's worth being sober minded and thoughtful about it and looking at the experiences of other states. I, I think the risks are really fall into four different categories, Byron. Uh, the first risk is one about how many people end up on the Medicaid rolls as a result of expansion. And in every state that has expanded Medicaid so far, the actual number of enrollees has far exceeded uh, the estimates. As an example, in Louisiana, they had estimated that 300,000 people uh, would be added to the Medicaid rolls. And today, there are over 600,000 uh, people that have been added to the Medicaid rolls. And at a cost of essentially double what the budget was, they went from an $8 billion budget to a $15 billion budget. Uh, on Medicaid. And so one of the, the issues is how do we make sure that the projections don't end up getting blown through at, at a heavy cost uh, to the state and to taxpayers? I think there's also an issue about who ends up in the Medicaid expansion population, Byron. So what you see in a lot of states is that it's people who are on private insurance that get dropped either off of the Affordable Care Act exchange or by a small business employer that end up on Medicaid. And as an example, in Mississippi, there would be at least 140,000 people that currently have private insurance that would get moved over uh, to Medicaid. And so that's a risk. Another risk is the idea of crowding out the people who are already on the program. So there are 800,000 Mississippians that are already on Medicaid, and it's largely children and pregnant moms, the disabled, the elderly. That's who the program was originally designed for. What you're adding to that if you do Medicaid expansion is able-bodied adults that don't have dependents. And so the question is, how do you make sure by adding all of these new people to the program that you don't make it harder for the existing sort of vulnerable populations to access medical care? 
And then the, the last risk that I'd note is a risk around labor force participation. That's become a buzz right now in the state capitol, wanting to improve Mississippi's worse than the nation labor force participation rate. But unless you can do this with some kind of work requirement that is firmly in place, uh, there's very little chance that it improves Mississippi's labor force participation rate. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office says that it does the opposite, that it discourages people from ultimately going out and getting jobs. And so those are the risks that I think legislators are having to grapple with. Those are the risks that I think uh, the governor is considering in his position. Uh, talk a little bit about this. You, you've written about the eligibility requirements in pretty detail, but Speaker White's bill would create a new category of Medicaid clients, adults between the ages of 19 and 64 years old, uh, with incomes up to 138% of the federal poverty level. It does include a work requirement subject to federal approval. You've noted that working poor Mississippians making minimum wages are already eligible for fully subsidized plans under the Affordable Care Act. So, Russ, if taxpayers are already subsidizing health coverage under the ACA, what is the difference if they switch over to Medicaid? Yeah, so one, generally uh, private plans uh, are more beneficial to somebody on a private plan because doctors accept private pl plans at a higher rate than Medicaid. Um, and so part of that has to do with reimbursements. Uh, reimbursements on private health insurance are higher than reimbursements under Medicaid. And so from a patient access standpoint, it candidly is a lot better that they stay on the private health insurance plans under the ACA because we know that more doctors accept them. For providers, it's also better that they stay on the private health insurance plans because of something called the payer mix. And so the way that medical providers make money is not on Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, those, are, those are volume customers, but oftentimes they pay under the cost of the actual care. They make up the difference with private health insurance that pays over the cost of the care. So if you're taking people off of private insurance and putting them on something that pays less than the cost of care, you're actually hurting hospitals, you're actually hurting doctors because you're disrupting the payer mix. And so one of the thoughts here is that you'd be far better off trying to cover what's called the coverage gap, which are people who aren't eligible for Medicaid, but also aren't eligible for these ACA exchange plans and that's about 74,000 people in, in Mississippi, that you'd be better off trying to figure out how to get insurance to that 74,000 than taking 140,000 off of private insurance and disrupting what providers get paid. Uh, but those who are on the ACA plans, uh, wouldn't they have really better coverage under the Medicaid coverage, uh, possibly more coverage and maybe less deductibles? Well, not really. I mean, again, the access to care issue comes into play that if you know that doctors accept Medicaid patients at a lower rate than what they accept people on private insurance means that it's harder to get in to see a doctor if you've got Medicaid. The other thing is that with these fully subsidized plans, they not only fully subsidize the premium, but there's something called a cost sharing reduction that the federal government applies so that the, the most that you could pay out of pocket on one of those plans is 7% of your adjusted gross income. Uh, and so the, they are affordable plans, not just in terms of the premiums being fully paid for, but they're also affordable in terms of co-pays and deductibles. And either way you're doing this, wouldn't you still kind of add 200,000 more people to the rolls and, and maybe in, in a customer base by, by either way you go? Well, I mean, no, in the sense that there are already people that are on ACA exchange uh, plans, right? So you've got 140,000 people that are already enrolled in those plans you're effectively moving them off, then you're adding the 74,000 that are in the current coverage gap. But then there's this other pool of people out there that nobody's talking about, which are people that have chosen not to sign up uh, for the current ACA plans. And you could end up seeing something like you see in Louisiana or Arkansas, where there are a lot of people out there who presently aren't, aren't choosing to be on one of those plans that end up on Medicaid and blows way past the projected number of enrollees. You've said that you're worried that the big federal match on Medicaid spending is not necessarily permanent. Uh, couldn't the same be said about the so-called Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, uh, if, which former President himself has called, uh, former President Trump has called uh, for its elimination? Yeah, so, so certainly anything that the federal government funds could be, could be changed, right? And so I think those risks are at play either way. I think one of the ways, you know, if you did full expansion and you took all these people off the private plans that they're currently on, that's an immediate disruption to the marketplace. 
versus some unforeseen future disruption to the marketplace. And I, I think most people would understand the difference there, um, you know, in looking at those two things. Uh, but certainly it, it is true that at some point the federal government may look at everything it's spending on health care and decide that states have to spend more of their own money. Um, and, and what we've seen in every state that's expanded is that the programs end up costing a lot more than what were anticipated. As an example, Mike Pence in Indiana uh, passed what was considered a conservative version of Medicaid expansion back in 2015. Currently, that program has a billion dollar budget hole. Um, and so they're having to make cuts to other programs in the state to try to fill the billion dollar budget hole that was created uh, by virtue of expansion in Indiana. Uh, you've written about Louisiana's experience. You kind of touched on this already in expanding Medicaid. Even though hundreds of thousands of people gain coverage, you note that many of Louisiana's hospitals are closing or facing financial collapse. But the state's new Republican governor says expansion has been a big success. And his office notes that more than three and a half billion dollars in economic activity and more than 19,000 jobs created as a result. Does that point to a more of a win for expansion than a cautionary tale? I think very frequently once a, a group of politicians has made a decision to do something that they're not going to come back and say we made a bad decision. Uh, wh what I can tell you is that Louisiana's situation is not some sterling success. They more than doubled the number of people projected. Their Medicaid budget has been more than doubled. What you see in terms of hospital closures is that they're happening at Louisiana just as frequently as they're happening in Mississippi. The same percentage of hospitals in Louisiana that are at risk. Uh, as what are at risk in Mississippi. Um, and then if you look at things like their labor force participation, their labor force participation has actually fallen at a more rapid pace than Mississippi after expanding. They also are the only state in the union that has had a, a, a economy, their state GDP has shrunk over the last eight years, uh, which is not even true of Mississippi. So I, I would say that, um, that there are plenty of signs that it hasn't been the boon that, that folks would like it like to make it out to be after the fact. The other thing I'd add on the 19,000 jobs is if you look at the billions of dollars that are being spent every single year in taxpayer dollars for the program, it works out to hundreds of thousands of dollars for every job created. Um, I think a lot of economists and a lot of economic developers would tell you if you're having to spend three or four hundred thousand dollars every year in order to sustain a job, then perhaps that's really not a good return on investment. Russell Tino, always good talking to you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, and we'll be right back. There was generally no mention of Medicaid expansion or health care last Monday as Governor Reeves delivered his State of the State address to lawmakers. As senior political correspondent Richard Lake reports, the governor emphasized economic gains as he laid out his plans for his final term. Governor Tate Reeves set the expectations for his address early on. This is going to be a boring speech. It's got no hot buttons, virtually no conflict, no drama. What I'm about to do tonight is to go over a game plan. That game plan focuses on Mississippi's economy, education, and the call for future investments into both. This is a state that is based on timeless economies. Agriculture and forestry, manufacturing and industry, world-class logistics infrastructure means world-class speed to market. Products move faster. Money flows back faster. More money circulates in our economy. That is the key to our future. On education, Governor Reeves called for an open mind moving forward. We must be innovative. We must be open to new and different models. We should fund students, not systems. We should trust our parents, not bureaucrats. And we should embrace education freedom. Governor Reeves did not say the word health care once in his speech, even as Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman and House Speaker Jason White have both sponsored legislation to expand Medicaid. I don't think there is any more pressing, more of an emergency issue than the health care crisis in this state, and not one word about it from the governor. 
And as Governor Reeves continues to tout recent economic development projects across the state, Democrats are still frustrated that areas west of Interstate 55 have been left out. I would like to have heard the governor say, you know what, we have not paid attention to one part of the state where uh, the majority of the African Americans in this state live. We're going to make sure that that part of the state that has double digit unemployment, that has a high poverty rate, that has no job creation, that we're going to do something about that. Reporting in Jackson, Richard Lake, 12 News. Big thanks to Russ Latino for joining us this week. We'll be back next weekend with more of the political and current affairs coverage that you demand. I'm Byron Brown from all of us here at 12 News. Make it a great weekend.